We're getting close to the end of the day here and just have a great session coming up. I'm really pleased to be able to do the introduction of this session and you'll understand why in a moment when I explain a bit of the background here. But um, first, the moderator today will be Lee Gallagher, who's a senior editor at large at Fortune Magazine. I was just telling her downstairs, it's the first time I've actually met Lee in person, but the first year we did the Fortune Change the World list, uh, she did the TV appearance for Fortune on one of the morning shows and I was just blown away. So very much looking forward to uh, seeing her in conversation with Jen Dulski. Jen Dulski is the head of groups and communities from Facebook um, and she is also the recent author of a book called Purposeful, Are You a Manager or a Movement Starter? And um, it's just making me chuckle a little bit because obviously Jen is now uh, with Facebook uh, and we're again talking downstairs about the many different ways that Facebook has been in the news recently. And some of which, just to be honest with you, uh, some of which she can talk about and some of which she can't. Uh, and I think you sort of all understand she wants to stay in her area uh, that she works in within Facebook, which is groups and communities. In other words, forming communities uh, from the billion, uh, give or take a couple hundred million people that Facebook works with. So certainly at scale. But the reason I was chuckling is because one of Facebook's uh, you know, things that, that they've been challenged with is around the idea of data privacy. And the funny thing though is if you provided us with your address, we're going to send you Jen's book. So uh, it's a funny confluence. And if you didn't, then um, we can't send it to you. But it was not ready yet for this actual conference and we're looking forward to hearing uh, from Jen. A lot of the work around that book came from Jen's time as the president of change.org. Uh, a website that many of you are familiar with that really has been at the forefront of movement building and really building um, a confluence of folks who are interested in issues and you'll hear some stories from Jen about that. She oversaw a tenfold growth in users over a five year period. This was building on a career that she spent at uh, Google, Yahoo, starting up her own business and so forth. Now the reason it gives me such great pleasure though is because as it turns out Jen and I have known each other for the last 20 years. And I um, and, uh, just feel very fortunate uh, here to have uh, someone that I've known. And even though Jen and I were not the kind of friends that kept in touch on a day-to-day -day basis, she was one of those people you find in your life that you just track and keep an idea of what they're doing because you're just impressed and you're glad that you uh, have been a part of their life at some point. So it just gives me such honor and pleasure to bring up um, a friend and a very successful technology executive in Jen Dulski, along with Lee Gallagher. Please join me in welcoming him. Hello everybody. Justin, thank you for that nice introduction. Uh, it's great to be here, Jen. It's wonderful to be here to talk with you about your wonderful book that I have read and it's really great and when you all get it in the mail, those of you who have provided your information, um, you're going to really like it. It's very timely and it builds on so much experience that Jen has, um, which is, it's, anyway, we'll, we'll be talking about it. Um, another tidbit about Jen and a background is that Jen and I also go back many, many years. We didn't know each other at the time, but we both went to Cornell at the same time and we were both on the crew team. And Jen was a coxswain and I was a rower. We, <laughs> we are probably a parent. <laughs> we put this together recently. We've come to know each other professionally through Fortune and, and Jen's uh, position as, as a tech executive, but we made that connection, so that's another, another little connection. Um, so Jen, um, one of the themes in this book is that you don't have to be Nelson Mandela or Gloria Steinem to start a movement. And there's a great quote that you have in the beginning um, I think it's originally attributed to the Dalai Lama. Anyone who thinks they're too small to make a difference has never tried to fall asleep with a mosquito in the room. And I love that. <laughs> I love that quote. Um, so how, so, you know, the individual is really a running theme through the book. Um, and I imagine a lot of that is based on what you saw in having a front row seat to movement creation at change.org. So tell, first, when we start with why did you decide to write the book? Yeah, it was interesting. As, as Justin explained, I spent many years working in more traditional tech companies uh, and 
Then I moved to change.org, which many people don't know is also a company. It's a social enterprise company rather than a nonprofit, which I think gets confused. Um, but one of the things that was so surprising to me was that regular people, sometimes really unexpected people, they were kids or grandparents or people who were incarcerated, they were starting these incredible movements and they were using essentially the same skills that people I saw using in business, tech execs, other company executives, people who run big business units. They basically were doing the same things. They were creating a vision that was compelling. They were persuading other people to rally behind that vision. They were persuading decision makers. They were overcoming criticism and obstacles. And so to me, this felt like what I call the leadership thread that runs between all these people. And it basically convinced me that you can, anyone can be a movement starter and you can do it from anywhere. And there's one other quote in the book that I love about um, Laura Linswood. She's the Secretary General of the UN Council on Women Leaders. So she works with the very small number of women uh, who lead countries in our world, which I believe is 50. And she says change goes from the unthinkable to the impossible to the inevitable. And she describes it a little bit like starting a standing ovation. And if you, I mean, how many of you have been in a standing ovation, right? All of us, I would assume. And if you think about how that starts, it starts with one person who stands up to clap. And then one person, brave enough to follow them, stands up, and then suddenly so many people are standing that everyone else stands up. And that's what movements are like, and they really are started by individuals. So then how do we translate that to the corporation? We have people here from corporations, and that's a large, you know, really what we're talking about here today. Um, so if the way, if individuals can be so powerful in starting change and starting movements like that, how can a company also play a role? Do companies need to have passionate individuals within, within their organizations? Um, and on the flip side, what do companies bring to movement creation that individuals can't? Yeah. So, um, of course, companies can start movements too. Um, I will say that my belief is that it starts still with individuals within that company. And those in that individual can be the CEO of the company or a head of any department. And sort of the more power you have, the easier it is to start a movement within your own company. But it doesn't have to come from, from that person. In fact, more and more today, these movements are coming bottoms up from people inside the company, employees who get passionate about something. Can you and, think of an example of that? Like I mean, I think a good example is a lot of what's happening around parental leave or policies for women in the workplace. So sometimes what happens is you know, the movements that helped women get mother's rooms in most offices happened because individual women at these companies were literally pumping milk in the bathroom stall and finally stood up and told their own story and said, this is what we need, and that started a movement. And so those are some examples. Um, the other thing that's happening more and more is that companies are starting to get pressured by their customers, as I'm sure we all know, and as we saw a lot happening at change.org, where it's easier than ever to mobilize large numbers of people, which puts a lot of pressure on companies. And so my view is that we're in the stage where this is inevitable. And companies can either choose to lead or choose to follow. And there's a story that I sometimes tell about this, um, about a classroom of kids that started a petition asking Crayola to create a recycling program for their markers. And this was a few years ago. They, these kids, they made a video. The video went kind of viral. They got 90,000 signatures on this petition. They love Crayola, right? They're customers of Crayola. They're not saying, they're not threatening not to buy the product. They're just saying, please start a recycling program because we go through a lot of markers. And Crayola didn't do anything. Um, and what happened Anyone was- Anyone from Crayola here? I, know, I, asked. <laughs> I asked in advance because I knew I might tell the story. Um, but what happened was Dixon Ticonderoga. Does anybody know this company? They make the number pencils. two pencils. They also make markers. And so what they did was they said, you know what, we're going to start a recycling program. And the CEO of Dixon Ticonderoga held a press conference with the classroom of fourth graders who suggested this and got tons of positive press for their company. And it became a really successful way to drive sales of markers for them. And then about a year later, Crayola, 
what did they do? They started a recycling program because when your biggest competitor has one, you kind of have to have one too. And so this is an example of like what it looks like to lead versus follow. And I think we're in a stage where, especially all of you in this room who care about this issue so much, are really in a position to lead here. You have a point in your book that actually, or a study that shows that the stock prices of companies who lead with this kind of purpose um, outperform, right? Can you yes, explain that metric? Yes, factor of 12. It's from one of the um, EY Harvard um, studies. I can get the exact stat to share with Justin. But yeah, I think we've all seen this. Companies that have purpose at their core outperform the stock. Also, 86% of millennials say that they want to work at companies driven by purpose. That's from the Edelman report. So companies that lead here will definitely hire and retain the best talent. And a recent Harvard Business Review stat shows 64% of customers use the values and purpose of a company as the main decision making factor behind which brands they buy. So we're sure this is good business. Mm -hmm. Seems like we're in a bit of a, um, a shift. Um, you know, we at Fortune with the Change the World list, we have documented companies that have built, you know, social purpose into their business model. Uh, and, and there's many, many examples of that. I'm sure you've been talking about it all day long. Uh, but in recent months, it seems that we're almost shifting to companies actually taking a much more active stance, uh, almost an activist stance on certain issues, whether it's gun rights, gun control, or um, you name it, you know, transgender issues that have come up. Um, uh, what, I mean, the, you know, this has come up a lot. And so um, are we moving from sort of you know, this leading with purpose to sort of becoming a corporate activist and, or is that all part of the same conversation? Yeah, I think there's two, two things I think about here. One is, again, part of this question of leadership or, or followership. In the book, I actually outline what I call the five stages of engagement that companies go through when they feel pressure from their own customers. The first stage being denial, kind of like the first stage <laughs> of grief. Um, but the, the highest stage of that ladder is what I call empowerment, where companies or organizations actually <laughs> empower their own um, consumers to act on their behalf. And we're seeing this in more and more companies where they want to achieve something and actually it's their customers who can best help them do that. Um, some examples are the various kind of gig economy players like Lyft or Uber or Airbnb, who Lee wrote a whole book about and could Thank you. Know, talk about as well, um, who actually have their customers advocate for changing legislation in the neighborhoods and cities where they want to see those things happen. So I think companies have a role to play in an activist sense there by empowering their consumers to act on their behalf. What I will say is that it, it is a difficult time where I think uh, many of us are feeling a lot of pressure, both from customers and from employees, to take a stand on certain issues. And it can become a very slippery slope where when you take a stand on one thing, why aren't you taking a stand on the next thing? And so from my perspective, I believe it's really important to connect those things to the core values of the company. What, what you stand for as a company should be what you then take a stand about. I think our customers respect us for that, um, and it helps to be clear to avoid the slippery slope. So at change.org, for example, we had a lot, of, a lot of employees and our user base saying, you know, why won't you stand up against this? Why won't you stand up against this? And for us as a neutral open platform, it was really critical that we didn't. Like we mm -hmm. actually could not take sides or else it breaks the way that the platform functions. And so instead we said, okay, what are our core values? And for us, you know, things like open access to the internet was part of what enabled our platform to operate. And so change has only ever taken a public stand on one issue and that's net neutrality. Mm -hmm and everything else we let our users speak. Mm -hmm. And I think we all know brands that stand for things. It's, you know, Patagonia is a great example. Um, they stand for, you know, belief and appreciation for the outdoors. And so for them to change their homepage to be about our current administration and their view on national parks made complete sense for their brand. And it was a bit of an activist move, but I think it stood by their core values, which is why it made sense. Mm -hmm. Before we move on, there is a question re related to this. How, how do you go from an individual, from the audience, how do you go from an individual starting movement within a company to the company taking on that movement? I think that's a good question. Yeah, so there's a, a whole chapter in the book about uh, persuading decision makers, because this is a key part of making any movement successful. You, you have a clear vision, 
a story you can attach to it. You start getting those full first few followers on board, and then you have the decision makers within the organization to persuade if you're an individual. And there are some techniques that come out of social organizing that I think can be very effective here in business, one of which is called power mapping. I prefer the term influence mapping myself, but social organizers call it power mapping, where you think about the person you're trying to persuade, you understand what it is that motivates that person, who influences that person, what they care about, and you actually try to approach them by understanding what it is that matters to them. And you know, myself, having been in the decision maker seat, which I'm sure most, if not all of you have been, um, it's helpful. You know, even when someone's trying to persuade you of something, it's actually good if they understand what matters to you. It makes it easier for you to see the benefits of that decision. So that's one technique. There are a number of others in there um, to talk about how to persuade the organization to get on board. Mm -hmm. And another question here, just from your book subtitle, what is the difference between a manager and a movement starter, and are they mutually exclusive? Yeah, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think there's been a lot written and talked about in terms of the difference between managers and leaders, and the idea being that managers are people who sort of see the world as it is. Um, they don't necessarily push to a you know, higher level, and leaders are generally seen as people who inspire others to, to follow them and to get on board. For me, a movement starter is a person who takes that even leadership to the next level. So they inspire others, but they inspire others around a cause, a purpose that matters, and that's the difference that I outline. So talk to us a little bit about Facebook and your role. What is your role there exactly as head of groups and communities, and why did you join? Why did you take this role? So I joined, I don't know how many of you uh, were noticed this, but Facebook actually changed the mission of the company last summer. Um, it used to be about helping the world be more open and connected, and the new mission of Facebook is about giving people the power to build community and helping to bring the world closer together. And that's why I joined, because I firmly believe in the mission of, of bringing the world closer together. It's also, as Justin mentioned, very large scale. So for someone who wants to make a difference in the world to be able to run a product that's used by 1.4 billion people every month um, is, is a kind of scale that's really meaningful. And my job is I lead the product for Facebook groups. Can I see a show of hands of anyone who's in a Facebook group here? Yeah, so maybe not, not as many as I would expect in an audience <laughs> like this. Um, so maybe I'll explain what they are. Um, so a Facebook group is a group of people that gather on Facebook around a topic that matters to them and that they have in common. And it's, they tend to be around the most important things that are in our lives. So family, there's a, a many, many groups on parenting of kids of different ages. They're about our, our work. There's a lot of networking groups. There are neighborhood communities. There are um, groups about health and addiction and all the, the challenges that people face in their lives and finding support from other people. If you think about it, it's a way to find those people who, who can support you and make you feel less alone um, that are otherwise hard to find. So for instance, there's a, there are big groups of people um, who are adopted, who come together to talk about what it's like to be adopted on Facebook. And it's not something you talk about in your day-to-day -day life. You don't go around saying, I'm adopted, are you adopted too? It's very hard to find those people and all of a sudden on Facebook you can find an audience like that who really relates to, to you. Um, and they're also about our, you know, everything, our most interesting hobbies and passions. So everything that people might feel is a little bit unusual about them, they can find other people like them. And one of my favorite examples of that is a group we recently met in the UK called the Very Old Skateboarders. And it's a, a group of like women in their 60s and 70s who all love skateboarding. And they all go together and they say things like, you know, before I felt really unusual and alone and now we're birds in a feather and we're all together. And, you know, there's a group for everything that, you know, if you love chopping wood, there's a group for that. There's just sourdough starters, like just all of these wow. things. Um, People can find their tribe. Yeah, you can yeah. find your tribe. It also allows people to start to understand people who aren't always the same. So it might be that you all love sourdough bread or you all love the same type of dog, but you don't maybe all live in the same place or have the same political views. And so we're actually thinking now about how we can help bridge understanding in these communities. And 
Um, so my job is to lead that product and you know, I get to support the tens of millions of community leaders who start and nurture these communities. And we do see brands starting these communities now as well, which I think is a really good tool that we're seeing a lot of companies start to use, again, to empower their own customers to both support each other, but also support the brand. So a good example um, is Peloton. So uh, people know Peloton, the bikes. Does everybody know Peloton, the at-home stationary cycling yes. phenomenon, sensation? Yes. <laughs> Uh, the interesting thing is there was a big Facebook group already started by users of Peloton and the company came in and said we'd love to take on this group and now the company runs it and it's become this really amazing support community of people who are riding their bikes and losing weight together and recovering from surgery and doing all these things and they're there because they love the brand together and they are making their lives better and it's not, you know, paid for, per se, by the brand, but it's just encouraged and supported by them. So th these are all wonderful examples, but I think we've also seen examples of how people, bad actors, can use Facebook or other social media to be, um, you know, with, with malintent. And so do, do, how do you police groups for groups that you don't want? Um, yeah, we take this very seriously. Obviously, we've been spending a lot of time on this. I joined Facebook. Uh, six months ago, just over six months ago, so a lot of my past six months has been um, focused on this. I have a whole team of people on groups that work just on integrity and safety of groups, and the way we think about it is twofold. So the first is that we want to empower the admins, the people who start groups, to keep their own groups safe. So even more than the Facebook community standards, admins of groups sometimes they set their own rules. We actually gave them a tool so that they could set rules for the group and they can ask someone to leave the group, they can mute people, et cetera, if they don't obey the rules. So we're trying to give admins the tools to keep their community safe, both through rules and through flagging content for them they might want to look at, et cetera. The other thing is we do focus on proactive detection and enforcement ourselves. So we have you know teams of people who build machine learning algorithms to look for inappropriate content and bad actors that violate our standards so that we can remove them. And how have the issues around privacy that the company has been, um, that has been a real issue in the past month or so, um, how has that changed the way you think about groups? Yeah, I think privacy has always been important to groups and for this reason we actually have three levels of privacy for groups even from the beginning. There are open groups that are public that if you're a part of everything that happens there is public. There are closed groups which are, are private. Um, that they're private but they're searchable on Facebook so you can find them. And then there are secret groups which are so closed and private that they're not even searchable or findable on Facebook. You have to be invited by someone else. And so we set the privacy levels so that people can control both the groups they start and the groups they join based on their preferences. Um, here's a question that I, that, I wanna, that I wanna bring up. Purpose and activism are great, but they don't always translate into business alignment. How would you advise internal change agents to actually influence strategy? Yeah, I think that the most important thing is to understand what the strategy is. And then again, it's sort of like influence mapping we talked about before, but instead of to a person, it's to a strategy. Um, and I think there's two techniques that I recommend here after you understand the strategy and make sure that what you're recommending actually does align. Um, I would pull one side from activism and one from business, which is to combine storytelling and data. So I find activists are really good at telling stories and business folks are really good at using data. And if we could just, you know, chocolate and peanut butter those a bit, I think everybody would be more successful. So a good example here is um, Amanda Wynn. She, and this is not a company example, but I'll just talk about how she uses um, data and storytelling. So um, she was a, a student at Harvard University. She was raped in her senior year of college and she uh, went to do what you're supposed to do, which is she went to have a rape kit done at the hospital in Massachusetts where she lived at the time. And she found out after navigating the labyrinth of the you know, police department that in Massachusetts, they only keep rape kits on file for six months before they throw them in the trash. Yeah, can you imagine them doing that for any other crime? This is what's happening to civil rights of sexual assault survivors. So Amanda said, I'm going to 
do something about this. And she first told her own story. She did the extremely brave thing of emailing everybody she knew and saying, this is what happened to me. Will you help me? I want to change this law. And everybody she knew said yes. She had lawyers. She had engineers. She had comedians. Like Everybody she reached out to said they wanted to help her. And Amanda got so good at telling her story, she actually ended up partnering with Funny or Die to tell a, tell a couple of these stories in a less threatening way so that people could understand and take those stories in. And then she put together this group and they helped her get the data. They went and looked at previous precedents, they went and looked at every member of Congress and they understood what it would take to persuade each one of them. They looked at the fiscal aspects of the law, how it would affect each district, et cetera. Then she took, she found other people who had been um, survivors of similar incidents she raised money to fly them all to DC. They all went and met with members of Congress. And Amanda and this organization she's founded called RISE, they passed this law called the Sexual Assault Survivors Bill of Rights unanimously in the United States Congress. It is one of only 21 bills since 1989 to pass unanimously. And she did it because she was able to, par to pair this story that was really compelling with the hard data to make people understand. So if there's one lesson you could leave the corporate folks in the room with, what would it be? I think I go back to you have the opportunity to play a leadership role here, to be movement starters yourselves. And it may be by encouraging someone else within your organization who has a great idea and helping them shepherd it through, or it might be by bringing your own idea to your organization to start that movement that you want. And it is, I think, viewing your potential advocates and supporters as being all around you is the lesson, right? Similar to the standing ovation, there's strangers standing next to you, but if you stand up and clap, they might too. And imagine if you told a really good story and had powerful data and understood who you wanted to influence, then the people you know, your colleagues, your customers, are very likely to support you too. I'm just going to end with a little bit of a speed round because there's a lot of great leadership advice in the book as well, just drawing on Jen's career um, and also how to enact some of these principles she's talking about. So I'm just going to prompt you and just in a couple, you know, few words explain what, what it is. Um, what is, uh, I can't even pronounce this, ICDICTA? Can yeah. you say it? There's a big acronym thing going throughout the book. Yeah, I used to, when I was growing up, my family used a lot of acronyms. We grew up before texting, but we had these acronyms we would use in our family, like FHB, which stood for family hold back, like when too many people came over and you didn't have quite enough food. You would tell everybody to just not, yeah. Um, so we had a lot of those. My and, favorite was IMS. Explain yes, what IMS so is. So in college, you know when someone calls you to go out and you, what you say is IMS, which means in my sweats. Like I'm not, not going to <laughs> in, in my night. sweats all day. Um, so ICTICTA is an acronym, a horrible acronym that I came up with, which stands for if I can do this, I can do anything. And the idea is that some of these things are scary and hard to do, and one way to help ourselves get ready to do them is to do other scary things first. So I took that philosophy when I was younger. It was probably even before I met Justin, but you know, I spent a semester abroad in the Amazon rainforest with the snakes and tarantulas, and I joined the volunteer fire department and just like did a lot of things that felt really scary. And the truth was then when it came to do other things, they didn't seem as scary. There's a lot of lessons about rowing, and um, I'll ask you one or two of those. T tell us what a power 10 is. Any rowers or coxswains in the room? Yeah, there's yes, a couple, all right. Okay. <laughs> so in rowing, you know, you row a very long race, usually 2,500 meters, and everybody is working really hard, rowing their hardest the whole race, but there is a concept of a power 10, which is 10 strokes at your absolute maximum. And the idea is you use them usually when you're just about to pass another boat in a race or when you're just getting to the end. And this concept is also really helpful in a work environment. I think the concept of a power 10 that you know, everybody can pull together at, for some important project just to get it over the line is really important. And um, people often say you know, life is a marathon, not a sprint. But 
Some sprints are really helpful when you need them. The key thing about a power 10, though, is that you can only take so many. And in a given race, I think it's usually two or three, and then people will just max out. And Lee told me before. Yeah, I've been on the other side of those power 10s, <laughs> and you, you get really mad after two right, or three. Right, because Coxley <laughs> calls them, but the rower has to do it. Um, so managing how often and how many power 10s is. Another interesting management uh, philosophy you have in there is the 90-10 rule. Can you talk about that for a minute? Yeah, so one of the things I found managing teams at a lot of places is that there's this concept of empowerment. Like the more empowered people feel, the more likely they are to, um, you know, to be motivated and happy at work, to be successful, et cetera. And so the idea of 90-10 is that people should be able to make approximately 90% of the decisions that are required to do their own job. And it doesn't have to be exactly 90, it could be 80, 85, you know, but some number where you say, okay, I need to be able to make most of the decisions. And I actually have used something called a decision log to track who makes what decisions and how often and for what reasons. And it's really helpful because if people get into a place where they, where they really aren't able to make those decisions, then I find either I'm asking them to do something that I shouldn't be, or I'm micromanaging them, which is bad. So um, we use, at most of the companies I've worked at now, the 90-10 rule. And when we're talking about wanting employees to feel this greater sense of purpose, I think that that is absolutely yeah. critical um, in that. So, uh, well, that's unfortunately all the time we have. Jen, thank you so much, and congratulations on a wonderful book. Thank you.